Welcome to Uncaged, the show that celebrates thought leadership from today's top business leaders. The program provides a voice to amazing executives from around the globe who are shaping the world of business today and mapping the path to the commerce of tomorrow. Today, we're speaking with Rachel Schreiber. Hey, Rachel, how are you? Hey there, how are you? I'm well. I'm really well. I'm excited to talk to you. Uh, Rachel is the executive dean at the Parsons School of Design. Uh, I don't know if Parsons needs much of an introduction, but it is, is truly one of the finest uh, academic institutions in America and a very, very important part of anybody who's in the design, architecture, or really any engineering disciplines, really, really quite an important academic institution. Rachel is also uh, the author of a new book called Elaine Black Uneda, and we will talk a little bit about that as well today. But before we do that, Rachel, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your career. Yeah, thanks. I'd love to. And um, as you said, being uh, Executive Dean of Parsons is a real is a real pleasure um, because of the, the strength of their institution and it's um, how well recognized that is globally. Um, I myself has, was trained as a designer and as an artist um, in photography and also as an American historian, which might sound like a disparate set of disciplines, but it, for me, they really come together in my interest it, that is really about understanding how visual images produce meaning in the world. Mm -hmm. And so that really, that really all comes together in the work I do now. Um, I have sometimes call myself an art school junkie. I <laughs> went to art school as an undergraduate um, and then kept uh, hanging around art schools as a student, a graduate student, a faculty member, an administrator. And I've just, uh, I've basically never left. So um, that's, been, excellent. That, that's, that's been my road. That's excellent. So I, I wanted to talk about a couple of things with you today, but I mean, let's jump into this new book that you have coming out. It sounds spectacular. Yeah, you know, I've always wanted to write a biography, but I haven't before. This is my first biography. It's not what I typically do. However, I do have a history in my artistic practice and my historical research of researching the lives of interesting people who made important contributions, but may not be well known or um, famous. So you've probably never heard of Elaine Black Yoneda, and that's absolutely okay. Um, but I hope that your, it, your and other potential readers interests will be piqued by hearing that Elaine was the daughter of Russian Jewish immigrants to the United States, who eventually settled in California. And Elaine married a Japanese American man named Carl Yoneda. They were both both communist labor organizers in the 1930s. At the time of the bombing of Pearl Harbor, they had a three-year-old son and Elaine insisted on accompanying them to the Manzanar Relocation Center when her husband and son were incarcerated there. So mm. she was a Jewish woman who spent eight months during World War II in a concentration camp, not in Europe, but in California. Wow. I mean, what a interesting perspective, an important story to bring to light and explore. I mean, tell us a little bit more about, about her I mean, it, and, and the impact. Yeah, I mean, I think what's important for me, for people to know is that um, the reason I think her story is, it's more than, more than just an irony that a Jewish woman would be in a, in a camp in California, but what I think what it does is it really, I intend to expose the kind of hypocrisy of the US government's claims to be fighting um, a system of racial classification in Europe while utilizing a very similar system here in the United States. And so what that, in, how that informs our present day in terms of our attitudes towards immigrants um, and xenophobia and anti-Asian um, bias in particular I think the themes are actually are actually quite salient. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's fascinating. Certainly over the last couple of years, we've seen several challenges um, that Asian Americans have faced in the U US for you know, basically generally Asian hatred, right? Yeah. And, and, and I was thinking that in the context of what we're seeing right now um, play out in the Ukraine, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see some some Russian backlash as well. Uh, size, I think the challenge obviously in the US is that we are truly uh, 
a mix and it's uh never it's well whilst i think sometimes we think it's a lovely pure <laughs> mix it's really more of a tossed salad you know <laughs> yeah. uh and and uh so it's a, what a what a fascinating story and i think that there's probably very valuable lessons that can be tweezed out here uh, that we can hopefully, hopefully not make the same mistakes again. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit more about Parsons. I, I mean, it's been a fascinating moment in the academic world over the last couple of years, as you know, we saw uh, the, the students not be able to go back to campuses, go back to campuses with all these rules and regulations because of the pandemic. Um, how have you guys navigated this? <clears throat> We were, Parsons is actually fortunate, I think, through the pandemic because we had been for at least a decade prior and maybe a little bit more, some of the earliest um, adopters and, and real pioneers in teaching studio art and design online, which I think for some people sounds um, impossible, but we, we don't think so. And so we were really able to um, continue with the education we have a highly international student population, so we also had to grapple with things like time zones that span the entire globe and choosing whether to be synchronous or asynchronous mm -hmm. with our online learning. And, um, you know, we, we, um, we fared well. We, our enrollment is higher than ever right now, so we're, we're, we've come back from that. Um, and we're really happy to be back on campus together because while well, as I said, I think we did really, and the faculty in particular did a terrific job of teaching online. I think one thing that we're really so completely um, inhabiting right now is how good it is to be back together. And we do have beautiful facilities uh, right here in the center of Greenwich Village. In addition to which a large attraction of coming to Parsons is to be in New York City and to right. take advantage of the professional, being part of the professional, um, seen whether that's galleries or fashion design fashion brands or design firms etc so we're, we're just happy to be back I, it's great to hear that the students are are coming back and and having that experience it's it, at times i think it's been hard to articulate exactly why that is so important um, but i think that any any parent or anybody who's been been on a university campus for a significant amount of time knows that there is something special about that community structure and building that's that's really valuable so it's great to hear that that they're coming back are there any things that you think will change in terms of the things that you guys learned during the pandemic on how you operate yeah sure i mean um <clears throat> i think that's where we and a lot of other institutions right now across the country and the world i suppose are turning their attention is like, what, what should we take from this time and what should we leave behind? Um, and there are many things, you know, I, I keep, I kept throughout the pandemic, um, thinking back to a moment just prior to the pandemic, when I was meeting with a group of faculty who are part of our, what's called our Tishman um, Environment and Design Center, very, a group of faculty, very devoted to issues of sustainability. And they had just signed a pact saying they would no longer fly for academic conferences. Wow. That this notion of of the you know the their their central concern of course was the environmental impact. There's also a big resource um, concern there, but the idea of flying people around the world to sit together for an hour, um, while it has many advantages, I think we are now much more comfortable with even this format and able to um, conduct our research and our kind of uh, convenings in this way where appropriate. Um, and then similarly for students, you know, I'll give you an example, um, just one in particular, which is that a lecture, your traditional lecture, academic lecture class, a recorded lecture turns out to be very beneficial for a number of different types of learners, um, whether that's English language learners, again, we have a very international population and, and other types of learners as well, where you can rewind, you can replay a portion of it, you can listen to it in pieces if sitting still for 90 minutes isn't your best way of absorbing information. So I'm not sure how long it'll be before we return to live in person. We, you know, we do have some courses that are 300 seat lecture classes. Right. Um, you know, and, and at this, and actually another good example of that is um, 
we have a very um, robust, what we call the making center, which is our wood shops and our knitting machines and our dark rooms. And during the pandemic, the wonderful staff of that area produced video tutorials for students where oh, wow. you used to have to wait for the once a semester orientation of the wood shop. Now, if you need to be reminded on how to use a bandsaw, you can turn to a video. So none of that replaces the fact that we want students to come in and use the bandsaws and the knitting machines and the 3D printers, but we are learning really where we can, um, where we can continue to make use of both remote opportunities, video-based opportunities, and, and basically the technology that I think yeah. we, we just became, we, we all by perforce became much more familiar with um, and adept at. So let me jump back a little bit on your new book. I think it's always interesting. I, I uh, wrote a master's dissertation on an Italian um, nationalist named Garibaldi, Ooh. and I spent uh, you know the, the whole process of basically a year, year and a half, reading every letter that he'd ever written and every book he'd written and and you start to feel like you're having this dialogue with the person and i you know i just be curious to to hear what spoke to you about elaine and and how was that dialogue that you had with her yeah that's interesting you know i i am um, i actually dedicated the book to both of my grandmothers um and okay. i they, my grandmothers my two grandmothers lived very different lives but they shared things in common with Elaine and they lived for similar years, mostly spanning the 20th century, so born around the start of the 20th century and passing away towards the end. Um, my maternal grandmother was an immigrant to the United States from Odessa. Mm -hmm. And my paternal grandmother was an immigrant from Poland who went to um, Palestine and, and then um, lived in Israel um, through her life. So um, I think that I've, I've had a very long obsession with um, women in the resistance during World War II with women mm -hmm. labor activists. And I think that I, I think part of my obsession stems from a kind of question that's very personal, which is like, what would I have done in there? Would yeah. I have been able to do what they did, right? And so I, I think it's, you know, we could, I suppose I should like go through psychoanalysis to, to consider that but no no I, I actually think it's a very very valid point you know we are presented in a we are living at a time now where certainly huge challenges are presenting themselves mm -hmm. and and I think all of us are asking uh, asking ourselves those those same questions uh you know how would what what should we do how would we sure. how would we act uh where do we take a stand and um, and and you you realize how unbelievably brave these people were. Yeah, uh, it makes them they're, they're, them them really stand out even more. Rachel, tell me a little bit about this year. I mean, twenty twenty two. I feel like it's such a big futuristic number. Uh, we've made it to the future. Parsons is a school that really has created the future for all of us. So, but tell us a little bit about what this year looks like for you guys. Well, I think that, um, you know, first of all, we're all, I think, in a process of recovery and healing, you know, that's mm -hmm. true. It's been a long stretch of time and the, the, the burnout is real. Um, and the, at the same time, that's coupled with the kind of um, euphoria of being back together in person. Mm -hmm. I think that as much as, um, I think that for us in higher education, um, we've been transformed by this period by both um, the pandemic and also by the imperatives of social justice that have come about after the murder of George Floyd at, mm -hmm. and, and other events. And in fact, I think that we, we actually don't think of them as really separate in mm -hmm. a certain sense. These are, these are kind of dual emergencies um, that have needed attending to that provoke big questions, big important questions for our society about how we care for one another, how we value one another um, in a pandemic that unevenly, um, whose impact, you know, were felt unevenly by populations depending on yeah. race, class, gender, geography, political orientation, et cetera. And I really believe that, I believe that designers and artists have a real, have very significant roles to play in addressing these issues. Yeah. So I think that um, many, um, I think that design and art education in the higher education realm is going through a real um, period of introspection to ask 
Who are we teaching? How do we, how do we, how do we participate in creating a, a community of designers and artists who are as diverse as the society that we need to serve? Right. So um, this is, you know, this is a central challenge. It's not to say we weren't aware of it mm -hmm. before 2020, but I think that there is, I, I actually, in, a, in an odd way, I'll say I'm happy to see that I think there's more of a consensus on how highly prioritized these issues need to be at this time. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I, I will hopefully uh, hearten you in, in, in my next comment, which is I, I went to a recent dinner party and found myself sitting next to someone who had just graduated from Parsons. Oh, great. And, <laughs> and she was telling me about what she was, what her passion was. And her passion was redesigning and rethinking prisons. Mm -hmm. and, and, and she really outlined, really, I, I'd say some very salient points, some of the things that uh, are societal and racial and uh, socioeconomic that have plagued our society, but also plagued the creation of, of prisons and how design has really been uh, flawed in terms of prisons to date, um, and at least in the U.S. Con context. And she was exploring some of the things that they had done in Scandinavia mm -hmm. and other places. And it was fascinating to... Mm -hmm perhaps just be exposed to, to those types of new ideas and new thinking and how, what role design can play sure. in, in that, that, that type of a rethink, which is so critical. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, Parsons School of Design is part of the new school, which is a university with a really deep history in social justice, um, which positions us very well to be addressing these kinds of questions. And if you think about you know, the range of, of issues during the pandemic. For example, we have an amazing program in data visualization. And I just, you know, as at the start of the pandemic, as I looked at the New York Times every day with its graphics that helped, helped us understand how the pandemic was spreading, where it was spreading and, and how important the visualization of that is. You know, there's everything from that to asking questions um, about, what will the interior design of retail spaces be in the right. future? And um, how should we design, how, and how do we, we have strong communications design. How do we design systems that enable us to communicate well and quickly with populations about safety protocols? And, you know, so all of these, and that's, you know, that's not even to look ahead towards questions of, um, we, we have long had a very strong emphasis in climate justice. Mm -hmm. um, our fashion programs look at everything from the um, practices of, of the fabrication of the of materials and garments to the labor and the afterlife of clothing. So that mm -hmm. we're not just we're not just putting more stuff in the world, but we're taking the responsibility seriously about what where does that stuff, you know, what what's what makes up that stuff, what happens yeah. to it afterwards. And also, um, how do we serve communities through design? Yeah. And how do we contribute to, um, to, to positive solutions to problems like our carceral system or you know, access to healthcare or many, the, the, it's really endless, the kinds of topics that, um, that we're looking at. Yeah, it's incredible. Well, Rachel, it's been amazing to talk to you today. Uh, we've been speaking with Rachel Schreiber. She is the executive dean at Parsons School of Design. She is also the author of a new book called Elaine Black Uneda, which explores the life of Elaine Black Uneda and uh, what a fascinating life indeed it is and very pertinent to many of the challenges that we are facing as a global society today. Uh, thank you so much for being on Uncaged today, Rachel. If someone wanted to reach you, where, where should they find you? I'm on LinkedIn. Um, they can email me at rschreiber at newschool.edu. Um, on Twitter, rschreiber, PhD. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. Great. Well, thank you so much for being on the show and look forward to having you back. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Bye.